Hi, A Pushers. Today's lesson is going to be on the New Deal, and we are going to be starting off talking actually about what people did during the 1930s in order to distract themselves from the worst parts of the Great Depression. Um, we're going to be looking a little bit at the culture and how that was influenced by the Depression as well as also was used as an escape. And so first thing we're going to look at is some of the big news stories um, that people were using as a distraction as well as um, they were using to um, to inspire themselves. Um, first of all, we're going to see some really incredible things being done at this time, despite the fact that it is a depression. We're going to be seeing um, the building and the uh, completion of the Empire State Building. And I'll talk more about that um, later on in the lesson. Um, we also have Gandhi's Salt March, where we're going to be seeing India start to take steps towards independence. We also have this fascination and this constant um, attention being paid towards gangsters. Now, during the 1920s, um, most of that is going to be focused on these bootleggers that are um, uh, flouting prohibition. During the 1930s, we're also going to have bank robbers, people who are going to be stealing money, um, kind of that, you know, Robin Hood aspect of robbing from the rich and giving to the poor. Probably the most well-known of all of these um, is going to be uh, Bonnie and Clyde, who not only were bank robbers, but also a romantic couple. We also had the creation of Monopoly. It was incredibly popular because despite the fact that it's the Great Depression for a short period of time, hey, you can be the richest person in the room. We also had some really big tragedies. Um, one of these was the kidnapping and murder of Charles Lindbergh's son. Um, the unfortunate side of this, obviously, is that the baby was murdered. Um, he was um, actually killed through neglect by the kidnappers. But um, the, the one silver lining that came from it is that it did prompt for the creation of a law known as the Lindbergh Law that actually makes uh, kidnapping and taking somebody across state lines a federal crime, which allows the FBI to get involved. We also had the explosion of the Hindenburg. This was a Zeppelin that was expected to be kind of the future of travel, but instead um, this Zeppelin, which is filled with hydrogen gas, extremely flammable, um, unfortunately it spontaneously combusted and killed everybody on board. And um, this was being filmed and being reported live, and so um, everybody heard exactly how um, how awful this tragic tragedy was the moment that it was happening. People are also going to be using art and culture as a way to tell their stories within the depression. One of these is going to be through um, art. We're actually in some ways going to be using realism again and we are going to be painting average people in average scenes and um, in some ways almost celebrating the ordinariness of Americans, people who were getting through the Depression. And you see this reflected in the work American Gothic of an average American farmer and his daughter um, in front of their small farm. We also saw this in the writings of John Steinbeck, probably the most well-known writer from the Depression era. Um, all of his stories reflect tales of the Depression. Uh, the story of Cannery Row are of people who live in the Cannery area around um, uh, Monterey Bay, California, and they are um, struggling just to get by and kind of how this working class community supports each other. The story of, of Mice and Men is about two itinerant farmhands who are just trying to kind of make their own way. But probably the most well-known story and the most iconic from all of this period is going to be the Grapes of Wrath. The Grapes of Wrath tells the story of a family who is affected by the Dust Bowl, um, how they are affected by the closure of banks, how they are affected by the mistreatment as they travel to California as Okies. Um, it really does a very good job of telling kind of um, this very broad story of the Depression, and it is extremely accurate to what a lot of people experience, and so that's what made it so incredibly popular. We also saw music taking on the story of the Depression, and probably the most well-known of these is going to be the folk singer Woody Guthrie. He writes all kinds of songs that are about 
the depression, including the song um, Hobo's Lullaby, which you see the lyrics here. He also has songs called I Ain't Got No Home, uh, as well as probably his most famous song, which is This Land Is Your Land. Um, that song that, you know, probably all of you guys sang as kids, you know, in some kind of assembly when you were in like second grade, um, that song's actually a very strong protest song. And it was essentially telling the government that this is everybody's land, anybody can live here. And especially telling those that were um, mistreating the uh, Dust Bowl refugees that this is their land as much as it is my land. We also are going to see different types of music start to become popular. First of all, um, like I said, folk music in the form of Woody Guthrie, as well as country western music. Country western music is going to be very, very popular and is going to be very prominent because of a new radio program called the Grand Ole Opry, which is still on the radio today. The Grand Ole Opry has today become kind of like the country music hall of fame type of thing and um there were some really popular singers like um uh, gene autry who you see here um who you guys probably actually know as um the guy who sings uh the real old kind of country western sounding version of uh, rudolph the red-nosed reindeer he was actually the first person to ever sing that song and most of the music of country western that was becoming popular became popular because it told a story and a lot of the times these were stories that were very recognizable and relatable because they usually had to do with people falling on hard times we also are going to see the popularity of jazz and blues continue but it's going to start to change a little bit first of all this new jazz and blues music is going to be um it's going to be different in that it's going to have a little bit more of a swing to it. It's going to be a little um, more involved with uh, traditional uh, instruments of trombone and piano and things like that. And you're going to have great artists and uh, 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 and play uh, sorry, excuse me musicians like um, uh, Ella Fitzgerald, Etta James. Um, you're also going to have uh, Duke Ellington, who you see pictured here. And all of this new style of kind of more swinging style jazz music is going to lead to the beginning of new types of dance, particularly the one you see pictured there, which is called the jitterbug, given the name because it looks like you've got bugs in your pants while you're dancing. And it's very fast and it is increasing in its athleticism, which will really reach a height by the time that we hit the 1940s. Now, one of the things that is going to happen with dance and music that is popular in the 1930s is going to be the dance marathon. For just a mere uh, anywhere from 50 cents to a dollar um, per person or per couple, you could enter into this dance marathon. The last couple standing is the one who wins all the money. They win the pot. Now, what makes it difficult? It's a literal marathon, as in you don't stop dancing. These marathons would go on for weeks or even months at a time. How is it possible? Well, you dance for 45 minutes and then you get a 15 minute break. In those 15 minutes, you can do whatever you need to do. Go to the bathroom, shower, or hopefully sleep. And so um, there actually became people who were professionals at marathoning and they would join these dance marathons and be able to win hundreds of dollars. While you're doing the dance marathon, you have a roof over your head and you've got three free meals a day. So it wasn't really a bad way for people to make some money, but also enjoy themselves. People went to watch the dance marathons for very, very cheap. And it was a lot of really kind of um, fun and uh, uh I guess, exciting competition when you would see these couples who are absolutely exhausted and now are being forced to run races or do push-ups or do jitterbug contests in order to get more people out and kind of keep it interesting. We're also going to see um, a fascination with sports because of the radio, we're able to follow these sports. One of these that is going to uh, grab the country's attention is going to be the horse Seabiscuit, the racehorse. Um, he was a very unlikely champion. He was actually potentially going to be put down, but because of um, the hard work put in by not only the horse, but also the jockey and the owner, he ended up actually winning 
um, a race against the premier racehorse of the time, War Admiral. And so this really kind of inspired the nation, this like great underdog story. Another great underdog is Babe Didrikson. She was a phenomenal, phenomenal athlete. She won two gold medals and a silver medal in the 1932 Olympics. And because of that um, uh, ability, she was brought in for a game uh, of the uh, of the uh, what would become the Oakland Athletics baseball team. Now they brought her in as kind of a joke of, you know, we're gonna bring her in and we're gonna have her be a quote unquote major league baseball pitcher for one inning. And it was generally to draw attention to baseball and kind of like, oh my God, we're gonna have a girl play baseball. Except when she went up there, she actually struck all three guys out and proved that she was just as capable as the men. She then decided to try her hand at golf and she was very good at it. Unfortunately, she was not allowed onto many golf courses because golf courses were for men only. She tried to join the PGA that would give her some credibility. Unfortunately, however, they would not let her in because she was a girl. So she helped formulate the Ladies Professional Golfing Association, also known as the LPGA. And she was a champion LPGA golfer. She bet, beat many champion male golfers in non-league matches and really set a tone for women starting to make a name in sports. In boxing, one of the most popular sports at the time, we've got two really important guys. On the right-hand side is Joe Lewis. He would become the world heavyweight champion from 1937 to 1949, and it was considered to be the best boxer in history. Um, he is also known as being very honest and hardworking and very polite and cordial, and that is actually part of what made Americans fall in love with him. And it's really significant because it's one of the very first times in history that an African-American became a national hero to both black and white audiences. And so um, he's gone down in history as one of the greatest boxers in the world. On the left-hand side, we have James Braddock, also known as the Cinderella Man. He um, started off doing really well in boxing, had made a name for himself, and then the depression hit and he lost everything. Um, at a very late age, he had to work his way back up and he became heavyweight champion uh, in 1935 and would hold the title for two years. Um, he really became kind of a symbol of that rags to riches story from the breadlines to the headlines. And um, that was something that really inspired a lot of people around the country. We also are going to have this guy. And um, this is uh, Jesse Owens, who is going to win a ton of gold medals and set a ton of world records in the Olympics. Um, and what makes it more significant is that it is going to be the 1938 Olympics, which is going to be held in Germany um, in front of Adolf Hitler. And this was Germany's attempt to show and prove the superiority of the Aryan race only to get their butts handed to them by this black runner. So um, this was a really uh, amazing way for America to kind of close out the 1930s in sports. And finally, America's pastime, baseball. The men you see here are the men of what become known as Murderer's Row. These are the first few batters in the lineup for the New York Yankees, and they all were home run hitters. Now, while we do see Babe Ruth in the beginning of the 1930s, he does retire into the early 1930s, and it would then be picked up by these men right here. The Yankees would continue to be a dynasty throughout the 1930s, and one man in particular is going to gain a lot of attention, and that's the one you see on the far left. That right there is Joe DiMaggio. And then, finally, we look at radio. Radio is um, one of the great ways that people follow sports and news and all kinds of other things, but there's also a lot of great programs that are there to entertain them. Um, you have uh, a lot of Westerns like Red Rider and The Lone Ranger, where you have the good guy who always wins against evil and villainy. And it was kind of almost a symbol for our success over the, um, over the depression itself. Same kind of thing with investigative stories like Dick Tracy. 
And then we have little orphan Annie, a little girl who's an orphan, who's living in a very horrible orphanage, who ends up being uh, adopted by the wealthiest man in America. Gee, I wonder why that was popular. And then finally, we have lots of comedies. Comedy was a way for people to escape the depths of the depression. So on the left-hand side there, um, we see uh, George Burns and Gracie Allen, um, this wonderful married couple who were fabulously hilarious. And then to the right-hand side in the corner, we have the Marx Brothers, um, where we have uh, Groucho, Chico, and, um, excuse me, Groucho, Chico, and Harpo. These three were phenomenally funny and uh, what makes it really interesting is that Harpo the one you see with the top hat he actually never spoke all of his actions in the uh, the radio stories were all done via sound effect now Groucho if you've ever seen those really dorky glasses that have the big schnoz and it has the goofy mustache attached to it that's actually meant to look like Groucho Marx and finally we have probably the most significant radio event to happen in the 1930s. In 1938, the night before Halloween, a man by the name of Orson Welles, who produced a radio show, decided to do a broadcast, a radio play, of the novel The War of the Worlds. Now, this was a book that had been out for nearly 75 years by that point. And yet, um, because it was done as a radio play, there were no commercials, and it was done as almost like a series of um, radio news broadcasts, like we interrupt your regular scheduled program to give you this breaking announcement. Um, if somebody didn't start listening at the very beginning, they were automatically going to assume that this was real. And so because of it, people actually began to panic, started calling their local police stations, calling their congressmen, trying to get in contact with the White House because they were afraid that we were actually being attacked by Martians. Um, and this just shows you how influential radio truly was at this time and how important it was in people's daily lives. Finally, we have the movies. And as we've talked about before, movies were really popular because they were very, very cheap. Um, inflated to today's prices, this would cost about $3, $3.50 in order to see a movie. They were some of the first air conditioned places. You usually got to see a double feature. You had cartoons and newsreels and, and um, uh, you know, you got to be in these beautiful theaters. And so they were incredibly popular, but it was also that the movies themselves had gotten so incredibly good. For example, we are going to have monster movies like Frankenstein, and we're going to have um, King Kong. We're going to have Dracula and all of these monster films. Why are these so incredibly popular? Well, because it makes people feel like one, that there's something scarier than the depression as well as what happens to all these monsters at the end they're all defeated and so it gives us this idea that the monster the depression can itself be defeated we also have a lot of musicals like um, the musical starring the dancing pair of fred astaire and ginger rogers we also have um, all of the shirley temple ones like baby take a bow and um, these were just fun and they were entertaining um, and they made people feel good about themselves. We also had comedies, um, one starring Mae West, who was very sultry and seductive, and of course, the Marx Brothers. We also had movies that were great adventures that helped us escape, like Tarzan and Robin Hood. Um, but then we're gonna have some of the greatest films that are ever going to be made. In 1939, it's considered the golden year of cinema, we have some of the greatest films that are ever produced. For example, Mr. Deeds Goes to Town, Gone with the Wind, Mr. Smith Goes to Washington, Snow White and even The Wizard of Oz are all going to be produced in 1939. Gone with the Wind would go on to be the number one grossing film of all time, surpassing The Birth of a Nation and would remain the number one grossing film of all time until it would finally be booted out by Titanic in 1997. Snow White and the Seven Dwarves is really significant because it was the first full-length feature film animated film. And so this is going to kind of start our obsession with Disney animation. 
And finally, The Wizard of Oz is important because it was the very first movie ever to be shown in color. All of these things are going to be great distractions from the depths and the destruction of the Great Depression. Now we're gonna get into kind of the real part of our lesson today, and that is going to be about FDR and the New Deal. So in the election of 1932, we're gonna be having Herbert Hoover go up against FDR. Now, Herbert Hoover is the current president of the United States. He wants to protect America's business by increasing the tariff, and, and um, he's very critical of FDR being relatively inexperienced. He didn't really have a lot of governing experience. He had a recognizable name because he was related to the former president, but that was about it. Now, Her uh, Herbert Hoover's slogan was, we are turning the corner somewhat positive, but not really all that positive. Then we look at FDR. He was the governor of New York, one of the most populous states in the nation. He wanted to lower the tariff in order to allow America's working class to be able to sell their goods overseas cheaper. He was critical of Hoover because Hoover hadn't done much to help the depression, but he didn't really have a lot of very clear programs set up when he was running for office. But when he ran for office, he ran on an incredibly positive slogan, Happy Days Are Here Again, which was one of the most popular songs of the time. And so when the election happens, we see an overwhelming majority of people um, vote in favor of FDR. It was one of the largest um, uh, landslides in American history up to that point. And when he took the oath of office, he gave his inaugural speech and he said some incredibly important words that we have nothing to fear, but fear itself. These words are so important to inspiring Americans and reassuring them that the worst days were now behind us and that we would, if we banded together and did not allow ourselves to become fearful of everything and fearful of the future and fearful of the depression and fearful of all of those things that we would actually be able to survive this and maybe not even just survive but maybe actually thrive roosevelt did not waste time in getting started in his first hundred days which has become kind of like the litmus test for presidents in how effective they're going to be as president um, in his first hundred days, he pushed through tons of legislation. Now, it made it really easy for him to do this because he's a Democrat and the Democrats very soundly won both houses of Congress. So it was really easy for him to pass the, uh, the laws that he wanted to have passed because Congress agreed with him on pretty much everything. And so these new pieces of legislation are going to help us kickstart America's road to recovery. The very first thing he does he closes all the banks. Now that's pretty scary to a lot of people because, well, if the banks closed, where am I gonna get money? How am I gonna survive? But he did this because he didn't want the banks to continue to have these runs. He didn't want them to keep bleeding out money. So he closed the banks and said they were not allowed to reopen until they were financially stable enough to open. Most of them would reopen um, at, by the end of the week-long bank holiday. I believe it's like 60% of them would reopen after one week. 80% of them would reopen after a month. And only I think it's about like 5% of them never reopen after the bank holiday. But it allowed to stop those panics and those bank runs that were starting to cause that massive closure of banks. Within this, he's also going to pass the Emergency Banking Relief Act. This officially takes the country off the gold standard. Why? Because if the money is based off of gold, there's only a limited amount of money that can be put into the system. If we take ourselves off of the gold standard, we can distribute as much money as necessary. People can pay off of their debts and that's gonna help get the economy started. And he's going to convince people of this through something called fireside chats. Now, typically when the president gets on the news, what do we hear? Good evening, my fellow Americans. But that's not how FDR started these chats. He wanted to start them off as a friend would, and that's exactly how he introduced himself. Good evening, friends. It put him and the American people on an even playing field, and they really responded to it. These fireside chats were 
extremely successful in getting public support for FDR's New Deal programs. They would be so successful during the Great Depression that he would actually continue to do these throughout World War II, and it helped him maintain that um, popularity during World War II as well. So what's this New Deal that I keep talking about? Well, it's based off of something called Keynesian economics. Uh, a British economist by the name of John Maynard Keynes came up with a philosophy that during recessions and depressions and times of extreme financial hardship, the public cannot afford to go into any more debt. They will not survive and businesses will continue to fail. The only ones that can actually afford to go into debt are governments. So it is essentially the best bet during a recession for the government to take on more debt. That way they can take some of that pressure off of the people who can now start to get the economy going and eventually help pay off that debt. The New Deal was a series of programs that were designed to help America's economy recover, give relief to the citizens, and um, be able to, to kickstart the economy. There were three clear goals that um, FDR outlined. They were relief, recovery, and reform, sometimes referred to as the three R's. Relief, meaning that he wanted to give immediate financial relief to those that needed it most, so that people can make sure that they had food on the table and a roof over their heads. Recovery was to ensure that our economy did start to recover, get people back to work. And reform, fix the problems that got us into this mess in the first place and try and prevent them from happening in the future. Now, this got the nickname of Alphabet Soup because there were so many programs and they all had an acronym. We're going to go over all of these at the end of the class today. So um, at that point, you'll understand why they are all called Alphabet Soup. And there is two different New Deals. Um, the first New Deal is during his first administration and the second New Deal is during the second administration. So if you see that referred to in any kind of um, uh, readings or any kind of test questions, that's what they're referring to. There's really no major difference except for the first one is mainly focused on relief and some recovery. The second one is focused on some recovery and reform. Obviously, we're not really putting as much focus on reform when we need to just make sure people can eat, right? So it makes logical sense. So with FDR's first term, there's a couple of big things that happen aside from the New Deal. One is going to be the creation of the good neighbor policy. FDR, when it came to foreign policy during the 1930s, was essentially to stay out of everybody else's business. It was isolationist, but he was trying to gain more friends if possible. Um, this was going to try and improve relations with Latin America by nullifying the Monroe Doctrine, Roosevelt Corollary, and Platt Amendment. Essentially saying, look, if you need our help, we're here for you, but we're not going to be the big brother who's constantly breathing down your neck. And as you might guess, Latin America was very pleased by this. But probably the most significant thing to happen in his first term that's not part of the New Deal was the passage of the 21st Amendment, which repealed prohibition. Why this was so important, ladies and gentlemen, aside from the fact that Americans were happy that they could drink liquor again legally, um, was that whole legal thing. Why it was so important is because now we're taking dollars out of the hands of organized crime and we're putting that money back into the hands of regular law-abiding Americans. Those businesses, um, those distilleries are going to reopen, bars are going to reopen, restaurants are going to sell alcohol again and make more money. There's going to be need to be distributors, etc., 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 for alcohol. All of that can now be taxed by Uncle Sam, and that's going to help pay for many of these New Deal programs. And so it was an incredibly important thing to help fund the New Deal. In 1936, 
FDR is going to run for re-election. He's going to be running against Alf Landon, the governor of Kansas. He did not like the New Deal because he felt that it was restrictive towards business, that it was preventing businesses from growing, and also it was a waste of government money, that people needed to kind of pull themselves up by their own bootstraps. And his slogan was, let's get another deck, kind of a play on words of the quote unquote New Deal. Get it? It's like a playing card thing. Um, Wood, uh, Woodrow Wilson. FDR is going to be running, obviously, on the success of the New Deal, wants to continue and expand it. And his slogan is going to be forward with Roosevelt. When the election happens, he wins in a landslide again, um, an even bigger landslide than he had done before. Why? Because of two new groups that are now joining his Democratic Party. The Democratic Party, if we recall, has typically always been associated with the Deep South, but now we're seeing it take over the entire country. Why is that? Because of the two new groups that are going to be involved. It is the party of the dispossessed, of the poor, the working class, African Americans. It's also going to be the party of immigrants and going to be the party of the urban masses. And so this big shift is now going to bring loads of new people into the Democratic Party. And they are still ones that are the big part of the Democratic Party's base. African Americans, um, minorities, uh, urban centers like Los Angeles, New York, Chicago are typically going to vote Democrat even still today. But as you can see with the election, not everybody agreed with uh, the New Deal. He did have his critics. The first of these is going to be a group called the American Liberty League. This was a group of very wealthy conservatives of both political parties that were fighting against the New Deal because they saw it as socialistic. Um, essentially, they're wealthy and they don't want to give up their money to poor people. Makes sense. Another one of these is going to be Dr. Francis Townsend. He is really upset because he feels that the New Deal doesn't do enough to help the elderly, um, the ailing, um, people that can't really work and can't really take advantage of these New Deal programs that are trying to um, employ the average American. So he had a policy where he was going to give a $200 a month pension to the elderly. Um, that would be today's equivalent of almost $2,000. They would have to spend that money every month, otherwise it would just be taken back. And this would help increase spending because, you know, they would feel the need to spend this $200 a month, but they would not need to work as a result. So it would open up jobs for younger people who needed it more. Problem was, and the question was, where does this money come from? Now, this would actually eventually inspire the creation of the Social Security Administration, but initially it's not going to be a super popular idea because they just don't understand where the money is going to come from. And finally, Father Coughlin. Father Coughlin was a Catholic priest who had a very popular radio program. Um, he denounced the New Deal because it wasn't doing enough for the poor. He initially had actually been a huge proponent of FDR, had spoken very positively about him during his first and second elections. But by the time that we get to his second um, term, Father Coughlin's going to start to become more and more critical of FDR because he doesn't feel like he's doing enough. But the biggest critic is going to be Huey P. Kingfisher Long. The Kingfisher was a senator from Louisiana and the champion of the poor. And um, there were a lot of poor people in Louisiana, extremely poor people, and he felt that the New Deal wasn't doing enough for them. So he came up with a plan called the Share Our Wealth Campaign. It would put a federal cap on personal wealth. Essentially, you could not have more than this particular level, which I believe was going to be $250,000. Anything more that you owned above $250,000 would be confiscated by the U.S. government and then distributed equally among all Americans so that they could have a quote-unquote um, minimum family wage. Now, this sounds great if you're a poor person, right? And he had the slogan of every man a king. Um, 
super popular. He actually had another common phrase um, that he used that he was going to put a chicken in every pot and a car in every garage. And um, that, that made people hopeful, especially the extremely poor. And if you can imagine, that made really wealthy people very, very nervous because of how popular he was. People were suggesting that he run for president um, against FDR. However, his, uh, his popularity was very quickly ended when he was assassinated in one of his um, campaign rallies or one of his Share Our Wealth campaign rallies, rather. Um, in fact, the very rally that you see pictured here. Now, one of these programs that um, we're going to talk more about later on in our class is the NRA and the NIRA. Do not confuse this with the National Rifle Association. It has absolutely nothing to do with it. It was actually the National Recovery Association and the National Industrial Recovery Association. But these two groups had created something called the Live Poultry Code. So these were um, uh, programs where industries would come together to create their own regulations on hours, wages, conditions, etc., etc., etc. The live poultry code had to do with chicken farming. And there became a Supreme Court case called Schechter v. the United States. And um, there was a farm, the Schechter farm, that was being accused of selling sick chickens. And so that gave this case the nickname of the sick chicken case. And um, those sick chickens obviously went against the poultry code that had been created by the industry. And so it goes to the Supreme Court, but what the Supreme Court ends up ruling really has nothing to do with the sick chickens, but everything to do with the NIRA. It said that the live poultry code and the NRA and IRA was actually unconstitutional because it went against the separation of powers. Why? Because these programs have been created by the president when in reality they should have been created by Congress because Congress is the one that gets to make laws. This would only be the first of many of the New Deal programs that would be struck down by the Supreme Court. And this really upsets FDR. He feels that he is being mistreated by the Supreme Court who doesn't realize how important it is for him to um, be able to create these programs to help the economy. So he comes up with a plan. And this is going to be known as the court packing scheme. FDR is going to put together a plan where he would be able to add six additional judges to the Supreme Court. And of course, if you can see from this political cartoon, they would clearly all be ones that agreed with him. And so that would allow him to keep his New Deal programs in place. As you can guess, it's not a popular idea. Very highly criticized. People see it as him stepping beyond his presidential powers and trying to become a king or a dictator. And um, this right here would uh, very much tarnish FDR's image. Another thing that tarnishes his image is the Roosevelt recession. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, we actually have a recession during the depression. Um, the recession would happen in 1937. And this was an economic downturn that was due to overspending by the federal government through the New Deal programs. The government had spent so much money um, in this kind of Keynesian idea of um, trying to, you know, help the average worker by the government taking on debt that they ran out of money and it sent the economy into a tailspin. Citizens were concerned that this was a sign that the New Deal hadn't worked. That wasn't actually accurate. Um, the, the New Deal had actually worked pretty well. It was just this fear that um, that maybe things were gonna gonna get worse. And uh, it only lasted for about a year and things started to pick up. It wasn't totally because of the depression though because in 1938, late 1938, we start to see movements by Adolf Hitler in Europe that starts to cause Britain and other uh, European nations to start to build up their arsenals. And so they start buying uh, steel and other war materials from the United States. 
We're also going to see FDR and the nation struggle with labor unrest. Um, there was increased labor unrest during the Great Depression, clearly because people were struggling to get by. And unions are a great way for you to fight for fair wages and fair hours and a living wage, as you can see these men right here. Um, this was caused be because of the Depression as well as the Roosevelt recession. And we saw the increase of strikes and walkouts during the 1930s. We're also going to see the introduction of a new major labor union, and that's the Congress of Industrial Organizations. They organized industrial unions, so they were like a union of unions, very much like the AFL had been. But unlike the American Federation of Labor, they allowed both skilled and unskilled unions to join their union as well as they were open to black unions. And that was really significant in increasing their numbers. Because of this, it leads to a lot of competition and conflict with the American Federation of Labor. Eventually, they would actually end up coming together and creating a huge um, union together. And the AFL-CIO is still around today. Probably the most significant thing to happen for labor unions during the Great Depression is going to be the passage of the Wagner Act. This law recognized for the first time on a national level for workers to organize, to bargain collectively as a group rather than individuals. Um, and this is also going to create the National Labor Relations Board, which helps enforce national labor laws and make sure that workers are treated fairly and equally under the law. Although we had had all these laws before for labor unions, many states did not enforce them. And so the Wagner Act was gonna help make sure that that was being done. Finally, we have the election of 1940 and Roosevelt is going to break from tradition and he, like his uncle, is going to be running for a third term. Now he's gonna run against a man by the name of Wendell Wilkie, who's a businessman from Indiana, is going to run on the fact that he's a very successful businessman. Um, he feels that the New Deal is unsuccessful, as we could see from the Roosevelt recession. And he says in his slogan, no third term, no fourth term either. Um, Wendell Wilkie essentially said, look, I've made a lot of money, so I'd be great at pulling us out of this recession. However, by 1940, things had gotten better. And as president, um, he would be able to continue the New Deal. And his slogan was Wilkie for Millionaires, Roosevelt for the Millions. And when we look at the electoral votes, we are going to see that he still wins by a pretty huge majority. Although it's not the landslide that he had in 1932 or 1936, we still see a massive number of Americans who are voting for FDR and hoping for the continued success of the country. The depression is going to end and the New Deal is going to be incredibly important to the ending of the Great Depression. However, it is not the real reason for the ending. It definitely helped America survive definitely helped make sure that it didn't get worse. It definitely helped get America back on its feet. But the one thing that would truly pull America out of the Great Depression was World War II, when we started to put America to work again as soldiers and as the manufacturers of wartime equipment. So that's going to be the end of our lecture today. We're going to be working on some flashcards that uh, tell you guys all about the New Deal.